From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations present and past who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties and our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. This season of Big Ideas focuses on sustainability and sustainable practices. True sustainability is dependent on equally balanced responses to social, economic, and environmental needs. Today's episode considers sustainable models for teaching young audiences about environmental concerns. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dr. Karen Serum and Samantha Farbaugh. Karen is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences here at BGSU with a research interest in biology education. She's written for academic publications and authored such works as Student Success in Large Enrollment STEM Gateway Courses and Bridging the Gap Between the Research and Teaching Cultures. Samantha is a sophomore at BGSU, majoring in environmental policy and analysis with a focus on sustainability. She's an intern with BGSU's Office of Sustainability. In fall 2021, Samantha worked on a research and creative project under the mentorship of Karen with Dr. Amanda McGuire Resnick, a senior lecturer with the BGSU English Department. This project, for which Samantha wrote an environmental children's book, was supported by the Center for Undergraduate Research and Scholarship, CURS, at BGSU. Thank you both so much for joining me today. Samantha, to start, tell us a bit about the project itself. What was its scope? What were your goals? Yeah, so originally, I basically wanted to create something that allowed for kids to understand the environment um, and understand a passion for it, not only how it works and wanting to create sustainability in their lives, but create a love for it within themselves. Because I think that's how sustainability ends up becoming effective because it's effective in ourselves because we want to see the sustainability and we're passionate about it and we feel a connection to nature. So originally I talked to Dr. Serum, I think in January of 2021. So about a year ago now. And I don't really remember the original purpose of talking to her besides just wanting to see how I could get involved on campus with sustainability. Um, And I mentioned that I'd always wanted to write a book. And she said, aren't you in the honors college? And I said, yeah, actually I am. And she said, you could write it as your honors project and just do it now. And so I thought, no time to waste and got to writing. Samantha, for you, what was significant about choosing a children's book as the form you wanted this project to take? I think it's really important to expose kids and just the younger generation to topics like climate change and environmental topics because it's so relevant, obviously, in today's society. I think young minds are the most impressionable, so I wanted to have the most effects, I guess, and I thought kids would be the best one. Also because it'd be the most fun, I thought, to write a children's book, most creative, I thought. Karen, We've all seen in, you know, recent years an expanded dialogue around climate change. We've seen young activists, right, like Greta Thunberg, uh, drawing attention, right? So, you know, very young people kind of as part of this dialogue and engaging children and younger people on some of these issues. For you, why is it important to start discussing environmentalism and issues of sustainability with children from a young age? Like Sam said, it's important to uh, empower and inspire that generation. And when you're young and small, you feel very small and you feel like perhaps your uh, impact, you know, the problems are too big for anybody else to tackle. And, you know, even adults, we wonder how our small uh, efforts can make a a difference. Uh, You know, with Sam's book, while not necessarily uh, 
you know, real, real and 100 percent real. It, it, it showed a, a great fictional story of children, you know, taking charge and making a difference. And so uh, I think that's an important message for for young people like like Greta, like you said, you know, um, and getting that that voice heard and getting people to, to pay attention and to think about those types of things. When Sam first came to me, I think she was um, sort of searching for, you know, sustainability was her passion and she was searching for some sort of project, right? She wasn't sure what she wanted to do, but um, she heard about me somehow and, you know, just got kind of got passed around while she was trying to figure this out. And so we, we started talking and um, I have a graduate student, Carrie Ritzenthaler, who is doing um, research on uh, environmental, what, what causes somebody to take on pro-environmental behaviors, to change their behavior. And so she's studying um, the different types of environmental education events that occur in the Lake Erie region and, uh, and whether they're effective or not. So because they're education events, are they getting people to change their, you know, do they learn something from it? Do they take on new activities? You know, are they, do they recycle more or whatever? And do they have a different attitude about things? And so when Sam came to me, I was like, oh, you can help us with this project. We have a lot of data to analyze. And Sam's like, eh, I don't know about the whole, you know, crunching the survey data numbers things. And so I said, so, so what are you passionate about? And she goes, I want to write a book. And I said, let's do it. Tell, tell me about it and let's do it. And so, uh, so that it kind of took off in that direction. So what, you know, Sam kind of led me to this uh, thinking about things more than me leading her. And with that, Karen, how did her focus, especially on young readers, younger than your typical research focuses on, how did that shape your own approach to mentoring her in this project? Well, I honestly, I told, told Sam this. I said, you know, this reminds me of my daughters when they were little and they were avid readers. And so, you know, as a parent, it was my job to make sure there were books, you know, all kinds of diverse books. And so as Sam was uh, sharing with me her vision for a chapter book where kids take on a problem and kind of, you know, override the, the grownups and, and, you know, take, up, take it on. I was like, oh my God, my daughters love those kind of books. I said, we need more of those. And if it has an environmental message or uh, brings um, children to a environment or, you know, location uh, geographically that they may not otherwise be exposed to, all the better. And, and so that's how we got to where we are. This is for both of you. So either of you can answer. The book especially focuses on efforts to preserve coral reefs, um, ecosystems that are quickly disappearing due to the effects of climate change and human interference. What's the significance for you in deciding to focus on coral reefs as an example of environmental issues? So I watched a documentary probably two or three years ago by now by Amir Zakiri. I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he was the first person who explained the coral reef issue to me. I had never learned about it before. And um, the documentary is called 50 Minutes to Save the World. And it basically explains the whole coral reef issue, how much humans have an effect on it. And it blew my mind that no one was talking about it and that Sure, I was watching this documentary, but like how many other people were going to watch it and how many people would change their actions from it. And it was such a severe issue, too, because the way he set it up was brilliant to me, because in the beginning, it almost was like a dystopian type of documentary because it showed him like waking up in 2050, where he like couldn't breathe clean air because the coral reefs help us have clean air. But because they were all gone, we had to have, you know, oxygen masks and stuff like that. Um, and I thought that was genius because he was showing that it seems dystopian, but it's the path we're headed towards. And that's very alarming, but he explained different ways we can help. And it just really inspired me. And I've always loved the ocean too. I feel like growing up, I've always wanted to live by the ocean for a little part of my life or write a book about the ocean or whatever. And so this was kind of perfect because coral reefs are in the ocean. They're like the life of the ocean, but they're also the life of us because they give us air. And so I just thought it was the perfect topic. And Karen, from your perspective, you know, as a faculty member in your own research and you're thinking about education, um, you know, and, and teaching science, how do you think about the relationship between sort of coral reef ecosystems and the other climate issues and environmental issues that we're getting more and more attention to around the world? Well, I have to say, initially, when Sam said, I want to do coral reefs, I said, I don't know a lot about coral reefs. And then I also said, you know, maybe we could situate it in place here in Northwest Ohio with the, you know, the different environmental issues that are here. And, and that was kind of my area of research with, with Carrie, my PhD student. And um, 
but she said, no, I want to do coral reefs. <laughs> and, and I, you know, as I thought about it more, I, I, you know, it really drove home this idea that it is important that we get out of our own little worlds because we can be living in a situation where we, you know, it's, it, it feels like, oh, it's not happening here. It's, it must not be true. Right. And so bringing the, you know, those, those environmental problems that seem distal uh, home uh, is really important. And of course, you know, I mean, planet Earth is one giant integrated ecosystem. So you certainly can't, you know, have uh, be concerned only about local things and not worry about the, the things that are far away. So uh, in terms of coral reefs and, you know, global climate change is far reaching beyond anything we can, you know, um, any, anywhere, any ecosystem you can think of is is feeling the effects of it. And so you can pick your favorite one and um, and still and see things that are happening there. So they're they're all relevant and they're all interconnected and very important. Samantha, you mentioned that one of the goals um, for the book is fostering in children a sense of responsibility and agency, right, to make change. How did you try and incorporate that sense of both responsibility and agency in the characters in the book and in the way you thought about telling this story? Yeah, so the main character, uh, Geo, in the very beginning when they're discovering the main issue of the book is basically that construction is going to go through the coral reefs by their town. There's a little section that explains how much Geo loves the coral reefs and how he's grown up being the blue fish and just fish in general swimming around them. And I wanted first for the characters to connect to Geo and his love for the coral reefs. So then that first feeling of connection with nature then drove like the passion and responsibility to take care of it. Because like I said before, I feel like there's not a sense of responsibility in a lot of people because they have lost that connection with nature or the environment. So I wanted first to establish that feeling of appreciation for the coral reefs in Geo. And then his friends, of course, are so supportive and he wants to save the coral reefs, so they want to save them too. And no one else is doing anything. So it's kind of like they have to step up and be the leaders themselves, which they're happy to do because they want to save the coral reefs. Yeah, and this highlights a really interesting uh, aspect of, of things too, because in order to get people to change their behaviors and attitudes, I mean, we can teach them the facts and um, and even get them concerned. But in order for a real change to occur, it's really who your, your local influence, right? So who your friends are and what your friends are doing and what your you know, societal groups are doing are the biggest influencer in terms of changing behaviors and attitudes and actions. And so Sam's characters kind of do that. There's one who just feels this way and, and the, their beloved friendships inspire the others to take that on. So you see this cascade of, of events occurring. And that's how it happens in real life. On that subject, Karen, of your expertise and your guidance of Samantha on this project, what has it been like for you working with Samantha in trying to strike a balance between scientific accuracy, clarity of information, with trying to keep that content really engaging for young readers? Yeah, Sam's probably felt uh, uh, Dr. Resnick and I pulling her in opposite poles sometimes, right? And so, you know, um, so she's, you know, she's written the creative aspects and then I read it and enjoy that and, and can offer, you know, plot ideas just from a personal non sort of uh, expert kind of version, thinking about what my daughters might like, for example. But then saying, you know, you've got to correct some of these ideas or expound upon them a little more. But then you don't want them to become dry and boring, you know, expository types of, of things. So how to weave those facts in is, is something I'm, I'm thinking about more. Like, how do you weave in the details? Uh, you know, the kids decide to do, you know, whatever um, certain uh, activities. And then I'm but how do you explain how those are significant and important and what the downstream effects of them are without just being dry and boring? And so um, you know, it's a balance that, that Sam has to strike. And, and uh, you know, we're, I think we're still in our last revision a little bit and, and uh, working on that. But, but it's mostly, you know, been through Sam's lead. I haven't, I've sort of stayed out of her way and just let it see how it would blossom. And uh, she's done an excellent job. And Samantha, what have you learned in sort of getting advice from two faculty members with different areas of expertise. How have you found your own voice in relationship to their mentorship? It's been great. It's been so helpful having both of them help me with the creative component and the scientific component because I wouldn't say they're opposites exactly. I do think they go together and I really thoroughly enjoyed working with both of them because 
they each had such good insight and things that I wouldn't think of. It is hard to find a balance sometimes because I do want it to be a fun adverse book for kids and I want them to enjoy it. And so that creative component has to be a certain amount of fun, I guess you could say. But then there does have to be that education. And I feel like too often science and fun don't correlate, but in this case, I wanted it to. And I think having both of them was the perfect mentorship to create that. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas Podcast. If you are passionate about Big Ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Welcome back to the Big Ideas Podcast. Today I'm speaking with Dr. Karen Serum and Samantha Farbaugh. Samantha, we've talked about kind of the different mentorship you've received from um, Dr. Serum and from Dr. Resnick. I want to sort of shift to thinking about collaboration. What has this project taught you about collaboration in having to kind of balance and get feedback and kind of work with these two very different faculty members and perspectives for this project? Yeah, I think the collaboration process has taught me a lot about being super sensitive, I guess is a good word for it, to my own work, because both of them have the best intentions and the best interests at heart and they also know best in their field so everything they were telling me I took very seriously and so even though I had created something and I wanted it to be you know something that came from me I also did want their perspectives and I wanted their input and so even though sometimes it was something that differed from my original opinion or my original plan after thinking about it I would realize you know I can't hold on to everything that I originally thought and I have to change my writing a little bit. The editing process never ends. And basically to make the best work possible, I have to listen to other people and it worked. And I really think it's come a far way from what it originally was. And it's become like the best version of itself by now. Karen, you mentioned your work with graduate students. How different was this process from the kind of mentorship and collaboration you're regularly doing with your graduate students? Well, of course, you know, with graduate students, we're doing research projects, right, and collecting data and crunching the numbers, trying to interpret it, applying some theoretical models to explain the data and all those types of things. Uh, but I have to say, through you know, mo- a lot of my undergraduates that I've advised over the years have decided to take sort of a different approach. I mean, some of them have come and, and done the, the research projects where they're crunching the numbers. But I have had one student in the past who uh, wanted to write a manual for how to um, uh, get involved in research and, you know, how to make tables and contact your advisor and, and just like the basics. And so a- another sort of writing kind of, of situation you know, I love the idea that the students are interested in science, but don't necessarily want to do science research, but perhaps science communication or, or, um, or just some blended kind of uh, way of having science as part of their disciplinary approach, see me as somebody that maybe could help them. You know, I do the research, but I also am interested in sort of these other approaches to incorporating science into a, a scholarly project. And I should say, Sam, um, her collaborative efforts have gone beyond just collaborating with uh, me and Dr. Resnick. She also, uh, as part of her curse project, uh, found an artist to do some illustrations. And I don't know if you'll ask her about that later, but, uh, you know, really, we've got the arts, we've got the the children's literature, and we've got some science. So it's really a a cool thing for me to see the scholarship and uh, incorporate all these different types of things. So it is really different than things I usually do. You know, there's a rare undergraduate graduate that wants to do something a little different than crunching numbers. And, and, and this is really, really exciting for me. And in, in some ways, it's similar to what I do because it's education, right? And so um, education is getting some information, inspiring, getting people to change their minds, to change what they know, to change what they do, uh, using information appropriately and things like that. So it's related, but still its own little niche. Well, you alluded to my next question, which is about the visuals, right? So, Samantha, you did envision this not just as text, but as illustrated. And so for you, what was important about incorporating visual elements as part of telling this particular environmental story for young people? 
I really wanted to see it come to life, not just the characters, but also, so for example, the coral reef in the beginning of the book, all the illustrations that I had my illustrator Lizzie do are in black and white besides the the first picture of the coral reefs and then the last picture of the coral reefs because I felt that the whole idea behind my book is that the coral reefs are dying, so they're losing color. So the one thing that should be in color at the end of the book is the coral reefs. So that is kind of what I envisioned for it because I wanted that contrast and I wanted readers to really see what they're supposed to look like and how beautiful they are and how natural it is because that's just nature. And Lizzie did a fantastic job. She really brought them to life and I'm really happy with them. So tell us a little bit about the illustrator and how how you went about kind of building that relationship and collaborating with her. Yeah, so I found her through, I believe I contacted um, the honors art advisor and she sent out kind of a detailed description of what I'm looking for to her students. So then Lizzie emailed me amongst a few other students and I interviewed her and she was the most prepared of the other illustrators and she had each of the characters in my book drawn and ready and exactly almost exactly how I had pictured them it was crazy and she just brought them to life perfectly so I went with her and remind give us her full name so we can give her credit Lizzie Varis yeah she's amazing so she started working on them I believe in November maybe or December Um, And we met kind of on a weekly basis and I eventually made like a Google doc that had each illustration and details for each one, how I wanted it to look. And she would send each one after she did them and she just did amazing. It was really, really easy working with her too. And what are your hopes for the project next? Um, You now have illustrations, you're continuing to edit and finalize the text what are you thinking, you know, beyond this semester or this as an honors project? Do you have uh, ideas for what its future might be? Yes. So the ultimate goal is getting it published. I reached out over winter break to a few literary agencies, and I did hear back from one so far, and we're in communication. Um, I might get an editor soon, and then hopefully once I get an editor, continue revising, hopefully that final revised version will hopefully be published, but we will see. But that is the ultimate goal. And hopefully I can keep writing because I really thoroughly enjoy it. Well, and that is a question for me too, is, you know, is this now something you see as work that you want to continue as you think about graduating from BGSU and what your future holds? What role does environmental activism and or creative writing hold within that future that you're imagining for yourself? Yeah, it definitely is in my mind because I've always wanted to be an author since I was little, but I didn't think it was realistic. And I kind of always thought, you know, maybe someday way down the line, I'll write a book, but I don't know the process. I don't know how long it takes. And it is quite a long process. And there's so many steps in order for a book to get published. You can self-publish as well. That is an option. Personally, I want to try to get it published with a publishing company first though um so it's just a really long process but it is definitely something that if I if I could create you know a job out of it someday it would be amazing and when you do think about publishing are you thinking about sustainability practices in the publishing industry and if so what are some of the thoughts you have about that yeah so one of my favorite books that I read growing up I actually have it right next to me it's called Ida B it was my favorite book growing up because the main character like talks to the trees and she's just super connected to nature. And I think I related to that as a kid. And so I was rereading it over break. And that's actually how I found the literary agency that I'm in contact with right now, because basically I looked to see who published Ida B and it was Harper Collins. And so I realized I've seen that name before and I feel like I've read a lot of books that have been published by Harper Collins. So I did a quick like Google search about like who publishes with Harper Collins and the first literary agency that came up it's I believe it's called Langton's International and that's who I'm in contact with now and they it's so cool I can actually probably read like the very last few pages of this book um okay so 
it says we care about the health of this planet and all of its inhabitants all hardcover editions and first paperback edition were printed on 100 percent post-consumer recycled paper so no trees were cut down to create the paper and then also i think the ink in this book is chlorine free or something like that it sounds like harper collins has done books like that before so that's also why i wanted to contact them because i wanted to make sure that there's maybe hopefully an option with my book with this printing where something like that with recycled paper so that no more trees are being cut down for it. So hopefully if I work with them or some other publishing company, hopefully we can get that figured out. As we move towards conclusion, I'd like for each of you to talk a little bit about any advice you have, especially for young people who are searching for ways to make a difference, you know, in the environment, or it could be on other social issues too. But Karen, could you start us off? What advice do you have for young people for getting involved and taking steps towards making the kinds of change that they think are important in the world? Like I told Sam when she first came to me, I said, I, I said, what is your passion? Because that's what you're going to put your most effort into, and it's going to uh, feed you and sustain you, um, and so decide what you care about and then go for it. Um, so if you're doing something because you're supposed to or because somebody told you you had to, it's, it's going to not uh, feed your soul. And so, uh, so find your passion, and if, something, if you care about something, there's a way. You know, where there's a you know, will, there's a way. There's a way to make a difference. And, and sometimes the way to make a difference is simply learning more about it and telling your friends. And other times it might be something, you know, initiating some program or, uh, you know, getting involved politically or writing a book, <laughs> uh, you know, or, or conducting research. I mean, there's so many different ways, but, but start small, um, you know, uh, find your passion, learn about it and talk to people about it and see where it leads you. And Samantha, what advice would you give to fellow students about how they can turn what these maybe kind of undeveloped ideas or hopes are into something in the world that addresses the issues they care about? I would say to reach out to people because, I mean, for me, connecting with Dr. Serum was like the first step in creating my book. And I'm so happy about that because, I mean, really, the more people you talk to, the more support you might get. And then just also connecting to something, kind of what Dr. Serum said, finding your passion, connecting to whatever topic you have will drive that passion and that determination to create a difference. So I would say reach out to people and just do it, just whatever comes to mind, whatever passion you have, uh, to not be afraid to try it because you'll never regret it if you do. Anything else either of you want to add? You get the, a chance to say the last word if we've missed anything important you want to say. I, well, I wanted to say I'm just I'm really impressed with Sam because she, you know, this is her initiative and her passion. And, you know, she led the way and she did all the, you know, figuring things out and how she's going to do things. And when she had questions, she didn't hesitate to ask us. And then, you know, we would turn her back and say, you've got to figure this out. And, you know, the next week or two later, she'd come back with a whole bunch of answers and, and then but a whole new set of questions. But she really took the initiative and, and uh, led the way. And it was really a, a joy to work with her in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Serum. You too. Anything else you want to add, Samantha, for listeners, maybe about kind of environmental issues? I would say always keep learning, be inspired, and take action. Do what's right. Thank you both so much. It was a pleasure to talk to you, Karen and Samantha. Listeners can keep up with ICS Happenings by following us on Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU or by following our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please subscribe and rate us on your preferred platform. For more information or to suggest topics for future episodes, visit bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Our producers are Chris Cavera and Marco Mendoza, with sound engineering by Deanna McKeegan and Marco Mendoza. Research assistance for this episode was provided by Lauren Degener and Branson Young, with editing by Carrie Hanlon.